Four, three, two, one. This is 2OF Entertainment. We're back another week yeah, it's great. another week yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. nothing exciting yeah. happened here in america so we're all good so <laughs> well it's still there i guess and yeah this week we'll see what happens we've been through this yeah. once before so yeah a few years back <laughs> so we're deja, vu, deja vu yeah, i know right and who says history doesn't repeat itself so. yeah god and, and anyway today you have a fascinating artist on i've looked at her work it's beautiful yeah um we have um uh, Nikki Jacqueline from uh, Regina, Saskatchewan. So we, she's a prolific um, plein air painter and uh, she's moving in some other different directions with mixing with jewelry and, mm. and uh, metals and painting. Um, and I think it's oil paint, I'm assuming. Okay. And uh, yeah, we'll talk with her about her process. And uh, I guess it, yeah, I guess we always talk about the journey. But right. we, we, you know, for lack of words, is where you know where did this idea come from? And it's it's kind of different. And I think uh, people might be intrigued by what you can do uh, creatively with uh, different mediums uh, and media, I guess. And uh, things can be moved together. Maybe just go to bring her in. Sure. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm going to disappear so you two professionals can talk uh, like professionals instead of me going okay. look pretty sweet figures and colors. And I'll see you at the end of the show. Have a great interview. Cheers. Thanks, Steve. Well, good day to you. Yeah, you're good busy too. girls. We, we, we do have to have our conversation and you can move on to other real projects that work with art and things like oh, that. Oh, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, yes, well, we're, we are glad to have you because I... I we've known each other for a number of years and uh, through artists in canada as well and through some events that you've been at and uh what you're working on now is, seems to be different than what i remember seeing before i used to see mostly just beautiful landscapes you know plein air ones and some that you do uh externally in your studio or something but can you kind of back up a little bit and tell us a little bit of your history i guess where where does this um start from where do you, where do you go? Uh, well, I've always been uh, known for painting portraits. It's about almost 40 years now that I've been painting portraits. Yeah. And then I had a chance to be a guest artist in residence at Cypress Hills. So for three years, I was hired to hike and paint the trails and then teach art classes on the weekend to park visitors. Yeah. And as I was doing that, I was just captivated by the light on the trails and how it shifted and moved depending on your view and time of day. And uh, then at about the same time, I I became aware of painting on copper and that the Dutch had been doing that since the 14th century. So I started to look into doing that and playing with copper as a material too and seeing what I could do with it. So it is, I work with acrylic on copper and oil. Okay, both, yeah. Yeah, so do do you have to prepare the copper for acceptance of say either mediums at all uh well the dutch would traditionally grind up uh garlic and rub the juice on the copper and then use lead white on top of that so that caused a mechanical bond between the material and oil but with uh, acrylic it's like working mixed media with any natural item so you want to create clean it really well with uh isopropyl alcohol and then wipe it off and then create a really good isolation coat okay so like and a lot of sanding too beforehand yeah so do you prepare the copper in any way like is it prepared do you you like just grab a sheet of copper and start working on it or do you or do you manipulate it a little bit or what do you oh well now now that i've uh i got the the idea to, uh, why don't I take some jewelry classes at the Neil Balkwell where I teach? And I'm glad I thought of it when I did because Melody Armstrong uh, is now retired from there, but I got all my 
my base classes through her. So I got a really good foundation with her. And so now I'm doing all sorts of things with the material. But in terms of preparing, it depends where it comes from. Um, if I get it from, oh, now the name's going to evade me, Rio Grande, it's already annealed and uh, it's not work hardened so I can work with it right away. But if it is work hardened, I have to anneal it a number of times and make it uh, more workable than flexible. Yeah. And there's lots of sanding and smoothing and then, like I said, cleaning it really good with the, the uh, rubbing alcohol mm. and sealing it. So do you do, you do any um, hammering and things like that as well with it? To oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. Well, we'll get, in, we'll get into that. So maybe we'll get Steve and start our, our first slide up here and we can uh, take a look at that. Here we go. So how big is this piece? About five and a half by five and a half and I think an inch and a half to two inches in depth. So this is a half lentil coal connected bead. And any of the techniques I've learned, like I said, they were applied to jewelry first. So I did uh, a couple of pendants like that. And yeah. um, always like playing with the material in terms of jewelry and then thinking about how might this inco be incorporated later into my larger pieces. Okay. So I can see through the exterior on this piece. Through the, there, there's some painting inside this. It's like a lot. Yeah. It's like this a, one's called the firmament, firmament, and there's a sky sunset in the background. Okay, that you can see through. So, what is the, I guess the, um, the, the love of this metal? Like, why, why not aluminum? Why not other things? Stainless steel. Well, that would be difficult to work with. But this is this is a soft material, but it's the color. I, I, are you drawn to the actual yes. color of copper? Yeah. It's the warmth of the color of copper and that it resembles more the light that I saw on the trails. Okay. Yeah. And then well, I knew yeah. there was a good history uh, of its use in the visual arts and, you know, in the past. So, yeah. And it, and it is actually a metal from the earth. So, mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, no, it has a, it has a beautiful feeling. It feels like a, I don't know, this, those, it's, and it's beautifully handmade. I mean, you're dealing with what a lot of floral designs and flowers and wildflowers is that what you're working with yeah this is a uh, cow parsnip is the main image on the dome and that was all hand sawed out with a coping saw or a jeweler <laughs> saw yes. i have to go a little larger than a jeweler saw in order, order to work at this scale yeah no it's uh it's beautiful imagery i mean i've always i've always loved pieces of work where you'll take a flat substrate and then work back into it we see a lot of people do that with laser cut now so people that people know this is hand cut this is not laser cut uh pieces of work and there's 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 quite a difference in the pieces but it seems to be quite commonplace now to have laser cut plate iron and everything in public uh hmm. in public displays as well have you seen these pieces maybe that one day they might become larger than five inches i've thought about it um you know requests for public proposals for uh public installations maybe i don't know well the laser cut is a good way to do it because a lot of them do that actually they just send it they do their design with they had get it approved and they send it to industry in the north end of town there and they'll uh they'll laser cut your piece and yeah. uh, manufacture it for you so it, is it's that really regina Regina or Saskatoon, most anywhere they have most of those industries have their own laser cutting facilities. So just yeah, you know, just look them up because this this has potential for uh, some really neat ex ex, oh, ex I'll call it uh, installations or uh, public sculpture, and yeah. let other people have manufacturers help you move on, do the lovely piece of work, and then uh, and have them finish it up like it's I'll, machine. I'll have to re request a tour. <laughs> Well, they are, you know, there there are a number of places, I'm sure, in Regina, as there is in Saskatoon, that will do this for you. Okay. Uh, yeah. So this is kind of the inside of this orb a little bit, I guess, so called it. Yeah. Now, this is a two-sided version uh, inspired by a poem by H.J. Lennon. And uh, our current show has uh, poems on loan. So all the work is inspired by one of his poems. 
Oh, nice. Yeah. It's it's nice to have those threads between the different arts. Uh, I, music and a lot of music. A lot of artists are motivated by music in their studios and different things. And uh, whether they listen to contemporary or uh, classical works. Um, and sometimes that sets them in uh, that comfort zone that they feel they need to be in. Do you, do you listen to music at all when you do your work? Or is it pretty much bang, 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 the hammer? <laughs> That's when I'm working on the metal, it's pretty noisy. So, yeah, music does, unless I had earbuds in. But now um, I'm just focused on what I'm doing. Right. So you're also part of the collective in Regina, are you not? Right, the Regina Art Collective. Yeah. There's so, nine of us currently. Right. So you show together and, and work together. Do you have a common studio that you work in at all, or is it mostly just show? It would be nice if we did, but no. Yeah, we're all, uh, we do meet monthly in each other's studios for business meetings. So we get to tour each other's space, but. Yeah, and see what other people are. Are, are other members doing similar things with, with Copper? Or subspace or they if anyone I'm trying to think Jeff Taylor might be experimenting with some metal work, but not I'm trying to think of an example, but I can't. He's a ceramicist mostly, but some of his work does bring in copper and he's done an amazing piece recently with uh, stained glass in it. Yeah, so you've you've dealt with people that have done mixed media before and right. Yeah, yeah. so you know, it's really nice when you're opening, I guess, a new area into your development that you have other places you can bounce ideas off of. And I, I really encourage other people to be part of groups and collectives if you can to, uh, you know, to bounce ideas back and forth and, you know, come up, be an individual, but uh, mm -hmm. come up with things that uh, are you. And, uh, but you said, uh, Melanie Armstrong is probably one of your mentors, I guess, and instructors at one time, correct? Right. Uh, probably 2020, 2022, I started with her at the Nail Ball Call and uh, until she left. Uh, so about a year, maybe two years. Yeah. I've no, worked with her and I'm still in touch with her when I have odd, odd questions. I forgot she actually on this one, she did the raisings and sinking of the dome. The previous piece that uh, you showed, I did the raising and sinking. Yeah. And uh, so she, before she retired to Mexico, she said, what could you do with these two domes? And I was looking at them thinking, hmm, I don't know, but maybe something will occur to me eventually. Yeah. So <clears throat> it's this is a collaborative piece with her. So, so she gave me the domes, I did the texturing and the piercing out and yeah have you have you thought about um working three-dimensionally with these in other words would the figure pop out more like make and then paint oh. the figure so it becomes three-dimensional um i remember because we have a copper plate in one of our in, in, in our cabin that i have and the top is made in germany and it was of course it's the beer festing thing and there's kind of i can't remember all the figures um, there's kind of uh, it's kind of old world a little bit of beer steins and people drinking around a big table. <laughs> That's why it's at the lake. But it's 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 beautifully hammered from the behind in the back. They're handmade okay. pieces, and so they become just three dimensional. There was no painting on it, but the the whole imagery is all done from behind, and they just push. They just keep tapping the material out until they create the figure. Well, the chasing and repoussé technique, I believe it that is what you're referring to. I think they work from the back and the front as well. And I did include, I think, an example of one of those. If not, I have one here somewhere. <laughs> but yeah, I am working on a portrait of my granddaughter where I'm considering uh, on copper and uh, thinking of doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, copper is getting more expensive, and uh, I don't think. But then, you know what? When you buy a large canvas, it's not cheap either. So, yeah, but it's a good quality. Yeah. Here it is. Here, a piece of jewelry. All right. So I took a class on corrugating and silver fusing, and just playing with it to see what what possibilities there might be. I'm still, still not 100% sure how I might use the corrugation, maybe as a, 
uh, border to another painting on copper. Mm, okay, yeah. No, this is a <clears throat> beautiful little pendant. And it just, I just, uh, I kind of blew it up a little bit for people on the other side so people can see <clears throat> the uh, the detailing of what's, how that <clears throat> was put together. Excuse me. And then I was playing with the, uh, flame painting here as well. Right. So, so that's painted copper that the piece that's wrapping, holding it together. Right. It was flame painted first okay. and then treated and then painted on top of again and yeah. then sealed. It does feel like you've bound a bunch of uh, stems of flowers or something together and with, with some kind of binding, and it has a really nice, it has an organic feeling you know, to it, which I kind of like, just kind of keeping with your work. Do you find that um, it's influencing what you're painting or you're looking for things that say, well, I can incorporate this imagery after I paint it into something. So these ideas are bouncing back and forth. Is this going to become a copper piece or is it only a landscape? We'll get into some of the landscape stuff in a minute, but. Um, this is supposed to be an Aurora. We had a lot of activity in the skies this last summer, spring, summer, did, fall. Yes. And so because I love the color of flame painting and how it affects the copper, I thought, Oh, this would be great for a, uh, doing an aurora borealis over top of it, right? <clears throat> and it's not green. It's beautiful. So there you are. <laughs> Outdoors, the, where I love to be. <laughs> yeah. Well, people are saying this is Cyprus uh, area. Yes, it is. And uh, if you ever have an opportunity to go there in southern Saskatchewan, it is beautiful, um, arid. And uh, a few mosquitoes during the season, but I would think a little bit. Not very many. No, Not that's many. why we liked it when I, we used to take our kids there when they were younger too. Yeah. My first experience was a grade eight trip. It was a week long uh, tenting excursion oh, in the snow. <laughs> it was a bunch of grade eights. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable. You're very brave to do that. I don't know. I have stories, but I'm not going to talk about my experience with a bunch of kids like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was one of the grade eights, so that's well, my we, first experience well, of that area. Yeah, we we were uh, <laughs> guardians of these grade eights for a weekend. It was they they challenged us. Oh yeah. <laughs> so you 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 do put on plein air uh, workshops as well. I see, and uh, I do and bring people. Is that annually you do one of those? Um, yeah, that was able to continue even through COVID since we could easily uh space yeah. ourselves outdoors and follow all those regulations yeah so that's been a yearly thing since well nice so well, you, yeah. so you do a do you, people can register on your website for that yeah or, oh, yep that's up on the store right now okay yeah well we let people you've got your site we'll have a site there so people can uh, look at that it's a great opportunity to get away with uh like-minded people that um you know, and paint in, in, a, in a beautiful area. And it's, uh, it's a lovely thing and it's a nice opportunity. So is this piece from a plein air painting? Air, um, it would be from a, a thumbnail sketch. Okay. Yeah. So you work, so that's, you'll do a thumbnail sketch and then bring it to back into the studio and, and work up into a painting on that? Is this what this one was? Yeah, that's one of the ways I work. Sometimes it's from a photograph that I've taken sometimes. Yeah, the thumbnail gives me lots of uh, flexibility with color and then I'm mm -hmm. not as tied to the photo. Sometimes that can yeah, influence me too much. Yeah, yeah. It's, photos are very handy, aren't they, with your phones? You, you can just snap, 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 and I'll do that later. And <sighs> it's never the same. It's just not, you have to stop and breathe and I, I, I like the feeling in a piece of work where you can almost sense the smell of the of the day a little bit or the prickle of the needles that you ran into or thorns or different things. I like uh -huh. the abuse that you can take when you're out and painting in the in the wild I guess we'll call it you know between the wind and the, the different things you have to deal with on a daily basis as a planner. I, I hiked out there quite a bit by myself when I was a guest artist in residence out there. It's a little different when I have a group in tow with me. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, is you know, and uh, you know, just got to be careful when you're out there. There's lots of stuff going on, even if you fall or twist an ankle or different. Yep. Things, wear proper hiking boots and such. I think we well, had we had a, a safety arrangement with the uh, park conservation officers that I'd report in when I was leaving, where I was going, and when I thought I'd be back. So, no, it's very good to have those. Yeah, check in points. So, what is the process for this one? It's mounted onto. Um, is that a copper a copper background that's been run through the rolling press to texturize mm -hmm. it? And I used in this case, I used uh, uh, some jean material because it's very much our cowboy boy west out there. Okay. <laughs> in our ranching zone, so, so that was that, one of the textures that I thought was uh, Cypress Hills. Okay, so is that <clears throat> attached to a hardboard panel? Oh yeah, then I um, uh, fixed it, scored the back, and affixed it to a masonite panel. Okay, so, so it's fairly, always... it's fairly thin. That it's not built out, or is it? Is it built out for hanging on the wall on a masonite panel? It's not. It's not um, like a panel. In that case, it's framed in oh, a okay. metal frame. These yeah. are smaller pieces that are about five by five by six, I think. Okay, so and then you uh, you you rivet the corners together. Right, uh, with the silver tube rivet. So that's another cold connection method. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, so it's, I've seen a lot of these panels where they're, they're almost, they're raised up off of the, off of the uh, substrate they're on. And that's another thought. The, li the little pins are attached at the back and you can't right. see them. They don't make a hole actually in the work. Um, but they have a nice raised feeling. You can, it gives you a nice three-dimensional floating. It's like a floating design, uh, mm -hmm. floating frame, and the shadows play really nicely to to make that piece kind of pop off the page a little bit. Oh yeah, give it a kind of a nice, important kind of a look. It's just an idea. We got lots of ideas. That's what the show is about. Just ideas, <laughs> things that are going on. But it's uh, it's lovely. I, I like that you know. Do you take chances? It's you know, not everything turns out the way you want a lot of time. Do you have a little pile of rejects or do you make smaller ones of them as they don't turn out? Or what do you do? With well, huh. yeah, you can always melt things down when in the jewelry studio or a, a pierced out piece like my what I'm wearing here right now. It started out, I don't know if you can see it, started out as a brooch and I got more excited about the pierced out pieces. Right. <laughs> and the negative space. So, yeah, different pieces will inspire. Eventually, they become something. Okay, here's another piece. that. <clears throat> so now we can see some of the work that you've done. And um, How thick is your copper that you're dealing with here? Oh, I got to think. 24 gauge or 20. Between 20 and 24 for this type of work. Yeah. The corrugated work I used 35 gauge or no, sorry, 34 gauge. Right. So, so the higher the number, the thinner the copper. Okay. Yeah. No, it's uh, again the panel has been attached to the copper. Now you said you you run this through a roller that because I see that it's not square. It's got a kind of a it, it, it's it's distorted piece, correct? Am I, did, right, it was originally rectangular, and then when it went through the mole, it gave it more of an organic, organic shape, and I thought, I'll just leave it like that, because it is about an organic subject, so. Right, <clears throat> yeah. So the motifs are in the background, cut out. Flower. Right, that's the three flower Avon. Okay. So these things are, are, again, are they mounted onto a board as well? Right. It's also mounted on a masonite board. So that's, and it's melamine coated. That's why you see the white through the pure stout pieces. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's an interesting integration of painting and like there's two different uh, mediums going on at the same time that are, that are reacting to each other, right? You, you've got a, you've got a painting that is depicting of, a space that is three to no, it's not three dimensional, two dimensional painting, but it's uh, color. And then you have like it's almost like a silhouette in the background. It's like the background pieces 
how do you feel the relationship is between the two pieces like there's a reason i why like that there. they overlap each other yeah. and then the textural por portion too is also uh from uh uh synthetic materials seem to work best when you put them through the rolling press so i like value village i go looking for a this was a shirt with some nice stitchery in it, and it had a floral design as well. Okay. Yeah. No, it's yeah. Where where the inspiration comes from is 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 is, uh, is interesting, you know. So you're you're plein air searching through some of the salvage stores and the <laughs> yeah. said like that. Well, you're always looking for, I think. As an artist, we look for textures and color, and we see things a lot of times that the average person doesn't look for. You know, we, you know, we look for little odd things that fit well with what we're doing, or will expand our knowledge about something in another direction. It's sort of like um, some people buy up books and they create built book sculpture from the books. You know. Oh. Books I went on a tangent with that for a while, and then I had to put that away because it was too distracting. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying, at one point, the book was initially intended for reading. It then right. gets discarded. It was going to be thrown out. And you go, how do you salvage a book? I mean, they're getting them for almost free, and you want to make something from them for a response piece or whatever you're doing. And and we, you know, people were carving these books and. Uh, they are interesting and in what you can do. And uh, the more you work with them, the more ideas you get, I think. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. You want to make sure you don't have a first edition, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Here's another one here. I think I prefer this one to the previous one. Uh, and why is that? I don't know. I think it, I, I think maybe it's the, maybe it's the lighting on uh, on the background on this one. Okay, yeah, it does. Re I always have that question. You normally don't want to have hot spots or reflection when you photograph your art, but with copper, it makes it seems like you do want some of that reflection so you get a sense of it being metal. Well, this one has a feeling of, you know, it just there's this explosion of shapes that are coming out of that one side behind the painting. So it's like, I, I don't know what it is. It, it feels it feels like there's this. Um, it's silhouetted in a very. It's very monochromatic. Um, it's a single bergamot blossom, and the purple uh, that you see in the painting is uh, the gap road on between the center block and west block of Cypress Hills, and you can see just masses of bergamot flowers as you drive through oh, there. Nice. Yeah. No. Well, that's what we look for. We sometimes look for color and texture and rhythms and different things in the landscape um, that excite you to pull over and stop and get out and go and do something. Because it's kind of a commitment. By the time you drag all your materials out, you want to be there at the right time of day a little bit and to absorb all that's there. And I'm still trying to, you know, put the relationship between the painting and the copper and um this this one is giving me this like i said this explosion of excitement in the background that is telling me maybe that's what the painting's about there, there's this hurrah that's happening and uh that, that's a that's a it's a personal thing yet i feel that the painting is tagged down with those four pins in the corners so it's, uh, this one won an award at the Man Gallery in their uh, winter festival, which is the uh, their members show, and they invite in a guest uh, curator, which was Wally Mann that year. Yeah. No. Have you looked at painting on wonky panels that aren't that aren't rectangular? I don't know that I've seen that. I well, guess. I'm just saying, instead of them being rectangular, oh. they were organic in shape as well. Uh, yeah. Somewhat. Yeah. I have done a round one. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, I did a commission piece that was a yeah. mosaic because when I did my study about uh, copper and working on copper, 
it was recommended you don't paint on a larger than 20 by 24 piece because of the expansion contraction rate and how that would affect the paint. So when someone asked me, how could you paint larger, the mosaic now is my answer to that. <laughs> well, people can see, they can see the texture in the copper in the background, this one. Right. Is that from the material? Yeah, that would be gene material again. And then I gave it a patina. So people understanding that this goes through a press, you lay the material onto the copper and then run it through the press. Yeah, and which has a lot pushes. of pressure and impresses the material uh, into the copper. Yeah. Yeah, that and it also breaks up that shine surface on a smooth surface as well. But it helps give it an organic feeling when you do that, like even even just the material shape. So would, when you do this, would other things do the same thing to it? So say you had um, oh, a handful of straws that you had picked from the dried, dried grasses and you lay them on there or something and run it through. Would that impress somewhat into the copper too? Uh, they'd have to be pretty hard. Mostly yeah. natural items will be disintegrated by the pressure of the press. Right, yeah. So... That's which why could I look be, for which could be interesting as well, I would think. But uh, uh, they end up not leaving. A, I don't know. I guess I could try it. Melody warned against it in the studio. <laughs> in the studio. Normally, yeah, don't yeah I'd ask her all sorts of weird questions because I'm working larger than the students. I'd say, "Well, what's the largest I can do this at? Will this hurt the machine?" Like I have to ask all these types of questions. Yeah, that's the other thing is, yeah, ruining the machine. You don't want to, don't want to ruin the rollers in the press. Oh no, yeah. yeah, that would be, that would be detrimental. Uh, but it's another one. This is a bit more warm toned. Uh, previous one had a fair bit of color in it in the pictures and this one here is more of the fall a fall tone mm -hmm. I can see your love of warm colors so I you know you, you're uh, you are a warm color painter and uh, observer I think they they really attract you I guess that comes from skin tones a lot of times you it's most you got to put warmth in the skin for uh, sure no matter what undertone someone has right so we're right now we're just talking about your landscapes and we will we'll talk about your portraiture here as we come up and come to it the uh yeah i don't know i, I feel like these this it feels this one feels really nice and it's cohesive and it it has this almost like there's this butterfly up in the right hand corner there's a it just there's this floral things it feels a little it has connection but there's disconnection with it which gives you uh Kind of a freedom feel when i kind of rather than rather than everything is nailed down right and it and i think the subject matter um i think they it, it works that way you're just trying to it's so different for me to see the way this is looking at and i'm trying to orientate to um to it i almost want to make the connection of branches together and understanding no this this is the this is the landscape and then this is a, a snippet of it in the background right there's this right yeah the flowers and that but again this this one has the gene material i'm assuming in the background on the copper yeah i usually do three at a time so there were three with the gene material so far yeah so how do you adhere those pieces that are floating in the copper uh i'm not oh well, i see you're what you're talking about that. so right. that would be treated again on the front and the back after it's gotten a, a patina and then i score the back and i tear it with uh, silicone and the the masonite board is scored as well okay so they're glued they would be glued to the masonite board with uh using what did i call silicone Okay, yeah. So they, I'm just saying those floating pieces because I know when you try to cut something out and keep it all together in one piece, right? And it's it's sort of like cutting out letters in the alphabet. You know that center in the E falls out every time, right? You you can't do that, right? You have to figure out how to do those things. So 
Um, no, I'm just asking those questions, just trying to figure out how how is it presented, like you know, in a permit. So this is fairly permanent. Now, there's no glass in front of this. I, I have done some where I put the glass in front, and I just don't like it. I feel like, well, you can wipe it like any other piece of art now that I've finished it right. with uh, a clean cloth, right? a soft, clean cloth. Yeah. No, it's... Uh... It's very different, you know. I just it's a well, you know, when you look at incorporating now, was this piece done in plein air initially? Uh, no, no, you uh, just paint it in the studio. Uh, it would have been a value study again. Mm -hmm. One year I did nothing but thumbnails and value studies because I wanted to improve my ability with that skill. So, how large are we looking at here? The the, the full piece of copper, about just um. Well, the piece of masonite to the framed edge would be five inches and a bit by four inches and a bit. Okay. But I'm so, just saying, I don't know. Whole, like, this is bigger than five inches, though, correct? The whole thing? Uh, no, out to the edge of the masonite would be five edges and a bit, uh, five inches and a bit, or six at the most. I don't Ooh. have my measurements here, sorry. <laughs> but okay, it's fairly so we, small. These are fairly small pieces. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. I didn't get that illusion. I figured these were in the, you know, 16 inches or something in that range, but. Oh, um, that would be the answer. Interesting. I don't know what kind of saw I'd have to have then. <laughs> That'd no, be difficult that, because the throat of the saw, I can only get a certain depth right there. They make them to a maximum size. So to be able to cut something out in the middle of a 16 by 20 piece of copper, you need a pretty deep throated, uh, coping saw. Yep, yep, they are out there, and uh, you go to some of the uh, industrial shops; they have them there. They're yeah. they're really not all that expensive. Uh, or maybe that's when it would be it would make sense to then go to the uh, laser cutting. That's the other way of going. You I mean you pay pay a little bit of service for it done, but you know what? They're meticulous. They you can you just do your drawings and submit that as a as a file to them and then they they output the file so we've talked about the the sawing but then there's all the sanding that comes after that <laughs> yeah of every edge and surface well laser cut makes it clean so ah. you, you don't have any edges like that laser cut okay. is really smooth you know? hmm. something to maybe uh go to the, those industries in the north end there and uh you can ask maybe of a sample. Yeah, uh, sure. And send them a little sample. And uh, I've had a friend here that created a sculpture in, it's now in the Royal Museum in mm -hmm. Regina. And you can see his, he cut out, had a bunch of butterflies and things cut out and they were welded oh. together in a big sculpture. And it's at the Royal Museum. How and, long has that been in there? A couple of years, two or three years. Yeah. Okay, I think, well, it depends which area. I take art class in there now and then too, yeah, uh, yeah. sketching the diorama, so I'll have to look for that. Yeah, it's a, it's a large piece. <clears throat> it's probably five, six feet high, and it's a diorama of um, welded imagery of wildlife and oh, rodents okay. and animals that were, that are in Saskatchewan. So they had commissioned it to be done. Uh, James Corpin, you can look at oh, that. I will. And see how fine some of those things were cut out, but they were all sent to the, they just give huh. them a file and they gave them a handful <laughs> back. And they were on fairly thick material as well. But Well, it'll be one way to lower the price too, uh, all the worry, labor that goes into these. about lowering the price. You know, all you do is, <laughs> you make a better 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 oh. right you okay less, you put less hours in it and let some industry take care of what they do well right you you hire them out it's no different than if it's your you're a bit of a a business but you control the quality and you control the imagery and hire it out to other people to help you get it done i think that's a smart thing for an artist to do and move on to that other project, right? And right. especially if you're, say you were to have a show and you needed 20 of these made, you're not going to have enough time to do 20. And I guess. Would, <clears throat> especially if there's a short deadline. So you need to figure out how to do that. And part of it is by hire, 
do make sure you control the drawings and the design how you want and let industry take care of that part of the production. Uh, you can still give them the annealed copper and say, I want it done on this material. And you prepare right. the base and give it to them and they'll do it. So, uh, but I think if you find a good one, stay with them and work with them and they, uh, they'll do you well for you. You know, I think that's, that's key. Have good working relationships is important. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Can you explain what's going on this one a little bit? This is that around piece. <clears throat> right. So I've mounted it on a cradle board and I okay. decided to let use clear gesso in the background to let the wood show through. And because I'm working at, this is now a three foot diameter, um, I had to break the imagery of the lily down into segments like a mosaic. And if you zoom in closely, you can see I'm using corrugation. I've used some doming and texturizing of the circular pieces. And then I have also, there's a painting that goes throughout the, the whole design. Yeah, I didn't so, include the enlargement. I just didn't have room to put them all in our in our process here. But I figured this was fairly large. People can see uh, mm -hmm. a little bit of what's going on. there. But you can definitely see the landscape, the horizon line and in right. the background. And this imagery is all painted up. Is it now this is paint, correct? Right. It's painted up within the shapes. Right? Mm -hmm. So what do you use to delineate the the lily like the the light lines that are coming through that is just the space between each uh copper piece okay yeah so i had to cover the board paste the pieces on to i use like a shower curtain <laughs> uh, and paste them where i wanted them paint the piece take it all apart <laughs> and then replace all the pieces back onto the uh the, the cradle board it's a jigsaw puzzle. Oh, um, terribly. I lost a few pieces along the way. <laughs> <laughs> Had to, oh, now what? <laughs> yeah. We always come up against problems when we're creating, right? Right. Well, we do, you know, but they also cr give us new opportunities. When we right. make a mistake or when we lose something, we have to do something different. If we don't have those opportunities, we don't take the, we just stay on the safe road. We never, we never experiment. We never try something. It's like when you go, I, I've had it happen. You go plein air painting and you forget to take one of your key colors for the oh, day. Yes. And you go, <laughs> why, what am I going to do today? And I, I'm not driving all the way back to get that paint. So you, you look through the box and you, you find, I, I remember going one time, I forgot all my brushes. And here oh, I wow. said, okay, I went out and found a stick and a couple of things. And I, you know, you soften the stick and it wasn't a brush, but boy, I got different marks than I never had. You know, I yeah, created I more of a, I think from the sticks, I, I flattened them and I did some spatula type paintings with a flattened stick rather than, and if I hadn't forgot my paints, my paint brushes, I would never have done that. I would have done it the same way I always did it. Right. And so you think. It's not a bad time, bad thing sometimes, you know. Right. And next time you I remember to take my brushes though. <laughs> First thing I, I purposely my... I purposely do that sometimes when I'm play, playing air painting and I'll put my hand in my paint box and just randomly pick out five colors. I'm always allowed white, <laughs> but I just pick out five random colors and I have to work with it. <laughs> yeah, white white is a damn one of those dangerous colors. It uh it is a color and uh it can muddy your work if it if you know it can make mm. things flatter. It makes and, everything cool. Yeah. Yeah. So you just you know depending on the kind of white you have, but typically it's titanium. But mm -hmm. uh, it, and it is oh uh, you assume that white is going to lighten what you do, right? And make it brighter, but actually it doesn't make it brighter you need to okay. either make something more contrasted to make things look brighter and watch your color you know what color is adjacent to the other color right to give it a mm -hmm. little bit of snap so a little bit of basic color theory really helps but you know white white's a real white is a crutch like not unlike a photograph is a crutch right uh, and it's 
it's it's refreshing when you can see um it's a little different you paint watercolor because white is in the paper mm -hmm. so if you learn to retain the whites of the paper you have that white snap it's already there but as soon as you do acrylic and oil white is an added thing to it and it can uh can change things up a little bit so this is a large panel now are these copper copper panels yeah it's a mosaic again so that's why you see the white spaces yeah. and but it's mounted on a masonite uh board again melamine coated and it's cut on an angle to fit a client's space so mm -hmm. they got an angular roof and it's about five feet by three feet on the tallest height so we get a, an imagery of the land and there's some celestial thing happening right as... and then there's some pierced out um wild grasses going up from the yeah. three quarters from the right or one quarter from the right punch up into the close-up of it so the scene is the frenchman river valley and it's called oh what we can see in the frenchman river valley because at various times of the year you wouldn't see all those celestial bodies at once but yeah those are some of the things you can see as you're out there right <clears throat> No, it's uh, when you <clears throat> it, it, it's a lovely thing to go through and be able to go through a valley like this when you see th th there's not a lot of tall vegetation, but when you can see these undulating hills that are interlocked to each other and they form the riverbed shape that was there many, many thousands of years ago, a river, um, it, you know, it. It's monochromatic, but it has a rhythm to it that is is different. And if you're there in August, you can smell the sage of the grass, and it, there's there's a real sense of land. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I think those are it's really nice that people can understand that. And you're bringing some now these panels. You'd cut them individually, correct? Right. And then they're adhered together into this uh, this commission that you worked on. Yeah. No, it's uh, it's a lovely piece. It is. It's unique in that the shape is different as well. So this isn't distorted, correct, by a photo distortion. This is the shape no. of the ceiling, and this is sitting up. It's taller on the right than it is on the left. Right. So their ceiling would have been angular, you know, matching. Mm -hmm. I had to match that slope of the ceiling. Right. So I made a template beforehand and yeah. at their place and did all the measurements. Yeah. We have to do that. We, gotta, we have to use a ruler. <laughs> <Measurement. laughs> now and then. <laughs> now and then as an artist, you have to use a ruler. Yeah. It's uh, it's a given. Well, this one is very geometric. I mean, really the play of the panels, the grid work, yet it's it's incorporated with the planetary so what was what was the customer asking or looking for when they asked you to do this piece? they just wanted to see what i could do on a large scale with uh, some scenery from out near cypress hill so this would be about less than an hour from cypress hill center block yeah and so, they gave me free reign <laughs> yeah. so what what motivated you to put the planets in um, well, in my time out at Cypress Hills, I love spending time at the observ observatory. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's a great resource we have there. And it's a dark sky preserve, or it, was, it still is, but uh, we're not the largest one in North America anymore. anymore. But uh, there in the Frenchman River Valley, too, it, it, the sky... The darkness of the sky is preserved so that we can see so much more than a lot of people can from larger um, <clears throat> rural centers. Right. Yeah, I live in a city and you don't see an awful lot. There's a little sparkle, but just the, yeah. the light pollution of the city, it just dims everything out. Yeah. So there's a movement now for um, cities to put in the lighting that points downward and has a hood over it so that it's not all shooting up to the sky. Mm -hmm. More for our tax dollars. Yes, we making everything better. 
Well, preserves the light, you know, the dark sky. Yeah. So this is when we talk about your portraiture. I mean, we're going to conclude on, on, on a couple of these. So again, this was probably a commission. Was this what this uh, was? It was a painting that I did for a solo show at the Assiniboine, Assiniboine Gallery in Regina. Mm -hmm. So this was about 1999, I believe. Yeah, it's beautiful. Very. Uh, so was it a commission to start with or, or is it just? Uh, a... No, I just relied on friends and family for subject mm -hmm. matter uh, to be my models and whatnot. And this would be a friend's husband with one of their twins. Oh, yeah. yeah. Very comforting, you know, to see. It's really nice to do portraits that are not just head and head and shoulders. All right. Uh, this one, this one really evokes um, feeling and emotion, and uh, when you can add uh, the relationship of a young one and a and a and a young a young child and a an adult, the it's it's difficult when you get multiple images in a portrait. You get two that are going pretty good. The third one is eh, the third, like you keep adding them, and uh, you know you think. This one really is is about a relationship between um, a father and a child, uh, but everybody's had a sleep on the couch, you know. And so when you put yourself into there, I mean, that I think that's what you know, that's the magic of this piece. Did somebody purchase this work, or has it been a a gift? Uh, the original was purchased. Yeah. Yeah. So there's there's this there is a comforting relationship that's created when you can create a place a space and you put people in it that it looks like they belong there tough to paint a black couch um because they just pop up <laughs> and a really nice use of grays i mean that's it's really important to you to get those shine the shine that's there and yeah this, this is the one i'm talking about you start doing was there five in this five in this portrait and they all came from different pictures and sometimes no, the expression yeah. was from another one and change the background that's why i don't do them there's just too many changes can you make me look this way can you move my arm can you do all those things and you yes you can but i prefer doing that now before you ask stuff after i painted it <laughs> yes oh we go through that beforehand <laughs> it's not photoshop and uh, no. you're right they you know they'll do a portrait for their family but they'll send you five separate portraits and it is a challenge for an artist to, you know, the lighting, especially when you put them into a landscape. Um, right. And uh, it's, they can look pieced together. And it's really important to try to, how do you make it look like a group, actually a group shot? I, and I encourage them, I say, I'll say, uh, we might look through, I used to be in the old days, I'd sit down and look through eight al albums with them in a span of an hour. And I'd suggest a story setting and the poses where I could make them look more like they're interacting together. But sometimes they're really set on having everybody look out of the, the picture, <laughs> which wouldn't be my first preference. <laughs> I like a little bit more interaction. Yeah. Well, that's the problem, right? You have a customer who is the client and they yes. are they are holding onto your brush a little bit but that's why they pay the money they pay uh, for commissions they want something done in a unique way part of it is and uh, maybe not so much today they can photoshop things together but this makes it look like they're all together in one place at the same time where it probably never really happened that they had an opportunity for this to happen all at the same time but when you flip through a catalog, you gotta make sure they're about the same ages, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. All of a sudden, yeah, yeah, the right heights according to yeah. each other. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot, there's a lot of challenge, and like I said, as you keep adding each figure in, uh, you know, first of all, do you, with portraits, a lot of people say they they got to get the eyes right first. Is that what you have to do as well? Yeah, if you don't have that, it doesn't look like the person. I agree. Yeah, the eyes and the nose. I felt those is very cruel, very much. Because you can put pants on people, but they have a gesture. And the bottom part, arms, legs, and things. But mm -hmm. 
but it's the there is gestures that are so you it's uh, do you do animal portraits as well or just i have yep yeah do you find that animals have that same kind of gesture yeah within the same breed if you like one pet it does not look like another one of the same breed so you have to get the right expression and <laughs> features and yeah <laughs> Oh, yeah, that, you know, yeah, that's I part see. of the family grouping, right? So that's how I got into painting pets because they're part of the family too. They are, and they do take on a personality and a look that their owners or participants in the family they have a look. I, and I remember talking to a one artist with an aquiline, a horse, and it was painted, but she said, that's not my horse because <laughs> it was the horse it was black and it did its thing but it wasn't her horse right mm -hmm. so it's really important that you got to get the right artist that that can see that personality in the horse as well that that everybody else sees it's harder it's hard to do um i think we relate we probably relate easier with people but i know there are some artists that just do portraits of animals and they just love it and trying to get those who is this guy <clears throat> um he would be one of the people that were in the moose mountain art colony and um, they have an artist colony there that's preserved from 1930s it was a 1930s uh make work project and cobblestone little cabins have you seen those uh, but now it's an artist colony Okay. And he and his wife, so this is John Pott and Marie Pott, they had one studio. And when I applied to show uh, be a part of the colony, they graciously let me share their studio. Oh, nice. But they aren't there any longer. Yeah. How, how long ago was this from? Oh, when I painted this one, maybe five years ago. Okay. Yeah. I think. Yeah, he 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 served well in uh, the war. You can see by his metals. Well, he was an RCMP and is part of the Legion, so right. the metals come as a part of that as well. Okay, it's yeah. a beautiful portrait. No, it's a. Oh, well, there he is. He, I know the kill the killjoy is back. So <laughs> just when you know it's the end of the show. So that was everything amazing. is beautiful. Let me ask you this. So if someone wants to buy something from you, what's your price range from where to where? From 385 to several thousand. 6,000 was the, the highest one that okay. I sold so far. We got that one with the, the, the odd shaped one. That one had been about 5,000 and, okay. and a bit. It okay. was a large portrait like this that was okay. in around 6,000. And that was Canadian? Right. So basically for everybody in Europe, it's free, but they charge a lot for <laughs> shipping. And in America, you can do the math. So very cool. But no, your stuff's absolutely gorgeous. Um, so you better just speak with Paul because he can get into the nuances. I just say it's all pretty and gorgeous and nobody cares. Yeah, so pretty that's pretty gorgeous. It. Yeah, it is. Pretty, pretty gorgeous. As, as Mr. Trump would say, I only use the best words. Anyway, <laughs> we thank you for being a guest on the show. Um, please come back when you have some more stuff to show us or tell us. Um, I would love to. Thank you to everybody for watching, and we'll see you guys next Thursday. Have a wonderful oh. day. Don't forget to subscribe Thank and like. You. Thank you. Hang in there for a minute, everybody. Yeah. We'll see you.